very much. So let me remind you a few of the notations. For me, G is always SO2R, K is SO2R, and then you know very well that G mod K is the hyperbolic plane, and we discussed it yesterday a little bit this NAK decomposition and the relationship between the coordinates you have in the N, the A and the K, and the coordinates you have in the hyperbolic plane and the orientation of the tangent vector. And we, we are interested in this question, how are the eigenfunctions of the Laplace distributed? So we, for instance, take gamma equals SL2C. But for the first part, you could consider more general quotients. And you have an um, eigenfunction of the Laplace on that surface. And we take not just one, but a sequence of such things, where the eigenvalues go to infinity, an absolute value. And the claim is that there is some correspondence between the behavior of these eigenfunctions and the dynamics of the geodesic flow on the space X, which is the unit tangent bundle of this H, so X is gamma quotient out from G. And the theorem that we are aiming towards currently is the following micro-local lift theorem that says precisely whenever you have an eigenfunction, we think of a, this eigenfunction as an eigenfunction with a high eigenvalue, then we can find a new eigenfunction, phi twiggle, which yeah, I said eigenfunction. It's an eigenfunction of something that we will discuss. But it's a function that lives on the unit tangent bundle on X. And again, it's an L2 function. Again, it has norm 1. So again, it gives you some distribution, some mass distribution on the space, which we can study. So this is the corresponding thing to this. Here we looked at dx dy over y squared. And here on the space, we look at the natural Haar measure, and we use the extension phi twiggle in the same manner we use the phi. And again, we are interested in the limiting distribution properties of that expression. And after choosing a subsequence, this thing converges to some measure. And this measure, that's the first property, will project down to the measure you had originally for the original sequence. And this new measure will be invariant under the action of A. So in particular, this tells you that the quantum limit can't just be a probability measure sitting at one point, right? Because that's not a measure that you can possibly get after, pro after projecting an invariant measure back to the manifold. An invariant measure is not just sitting at one point. An invariant measure is sitting on an orbit or an orbit closure. So this invariance property here, together with the projecting statement, already tells you something about the measure that you were interested in in the beginning. Namely that, for instance, the support of that measure needs to be a union of geodesic lines. It can't be just a point. And this measure mu twiggle is called the microlocal lift of mu or the quantum limit of the original sequence. And we will construct that lifted function phi twiggle by applying differential operators to the original function. So the original function phi, ah, this is a different slide. The original function phi is defined on M, right? On this M, which is this thing. But that's a quotient of this X, namely, it's when you quotient out here the K, then you get this, obviously, from the, all the picture here. So every function 
that is a function on m we can also think of as a function on x. It's just a function that happens to be invariant under k. And this is where the next slide fits in because we can, we can study the action of k more generally. There are invariant functions, that's all right. Some functions are invariant under k. Those are the functions that actually live on the manifold. But there are also some functions that have a different type, a different weight for the action of k. And this is sort of a Fourier analog of, yeah, you know Fourier series, where you just consider the torus and you have a function and then you decompose the function into the Fourier series, right? Here we do the same thing, we can do the same thing, because k is the circle group, k is just the torus. K is SO2. It's just a torus. So we can restrict a function f that is defined on x. We can restrict it to an orbit of k. And then we get a function on k. And then we can take the Fourier series of that function. Right? But that Fourier coefficient, so to speak, we can also think of as a function of the original point that we started with. And this is what we can do here. So we take a function f that is smooth on x, and then you can define something like the Fourier coefficient, fn of x, for the action of, for the action of k, by convoluting the function with the action of, with the character under the action of k. So that's just convolution as you have seen it always, except that this time the, fu the function f lives on x and we only integrate along k to get a new function. So this depends, is not a constant, it depends on x. And this new function fn of x is now an eigenfunction under k, which is an easy substitution from this formula. And just the same proof or even a corollary of Fourier series expansion on the torus is that when you start with a smooth function, then f is equal to the infinite sum of the fn's. And you can make this more precise. I mean, for instance, if the function f has con is smooth and has compact support, then the convergence is uniform and, and many other things you can say about this. So that brings us to the discussion of these eigenspaces. An is, is the space of all eigenfunctions of this particular weight when k acts. That's like, yeah, it's an, it's an eigenfunction under the action of k. k is a group, of course, right? It's not just an element. So when the group acts, and you have an eigenfunction, then for every element of the acting group, there should be a scalar, a complex number, so that the f co composed with k is equal to that complex number times f. And of course, we want some consistent choice of this complex number as a function of k. And of course, we take the usual characters. So e, e n here is just e to the 2 pi i n times the parameter theta, which is in the k. So k is an element in SO2. It's just cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. And, and this you should think of as an eigenfunction, the space of eigenfunctions of a particular type under the action of k. And More generally, you can say f is a k-finite if it's a finite sum of such eigenfunctions. If it's a trigonometric polynomial, right? That's sort of the analog of a trig trigonometric polynomial. Now, here I wrote something else. There's a different definition for this eigenspace an, which I want to explain to you. So w, in the notes it's some fancy w, is 
the element that corresponds to the, that generates the V algebra of K. And we discussed yesterday a little bit that if you have an element in the Lie algebra, then this element acts on smooth functions. So I, I'm considering now smooth functions. You can do these definitions of a n and and convolution and so on also on in L2 and in different spaces, but I don't want to get too technical, so back to the picture here. We are looking at the smooth function, so we know what W applied to F means. W applied to F is just the partial derivative of F. Yeah, this is at x, x exp t w. You take this partial derivative along t, partial because x is also sort of a high dimensional variable, and then you take t equals zero to kill the t, and then you get a new function. Now, the claim is that if you are an eigenfunction of type n, of weight n, then when you hit it with the w, all you get is i times n times the function. So suddenly we really have one operator that's, that's acting on the eigenspace as really multiplying by one number, i times n. And this is, one direction is clear, but because if you have a function that has the property that f x k theta is equal to e n k theta, which is this e to the 2 pi i n theta times f of x, if f satisfies this property and you then calculate this expression, then obviously you get, what do you get? The e n k t f of x. And now you take the derivative of this with respect to t, but of course now the f of x doesn't matter any longer. You just take the derivative of either the 2 pi i n t with respect to t, and I guess my normalization is a bit off by this 2 pi. So in the notes it's everything is perfect, so we believe that. Opposite, the opposite direction is similar if you know, if you know that w applied to f is equal to a constant times f, let me write i n, whether or not the 2 pi i shows up, let's ignore that. If you know that, then you can look at the expression e to the e n k, what is the trick? This is, a, in some sense, very standard thing to look at. But I want to remind you of this picture. You can just look at this expression f of x k theta modified by e n minus k, k theta. Of course, k is an element in the SL2, so it should be k theta inverse. You can look at this and then take the partial derivative of this expression with respect to theta. And that derivative with respect to theta, well, theta appears twice, so you have to use the product rule. And when you take the derivative of this with respect to theta, all you're doing is calculating wf, and there we get the inf, right? And when you take the derivative of this expression with respect to theta, you perfectly well know what you get. So when you do this partial derivative thing, and everything works, then all you're getting here is zeros, which tells you that this expression doesn't change, but then this tells you precisely the formula that was the definition of a n. So well, I hope this convinces you that there's some relationship between formulas that involve elements in S, little SL2R and 
statements that involve the action of capital SO2R. And in the notes, more of these cases that are used are explained, but I don't quite have the time to do them all in detail, but I wanted to do one example. Okay. Yesterday, I also stated this proposition, which is all, again very classical. As, yeah, it's part of the basic of Lee theory that if you take this difference of the degree two partial differential operators, where you take two elements in the lesser two, M and W, and then you take, you let W act on F, that gives you a partial derivative along some direction. You take, you apply M, which is again a partial derivative in some direction, to that partial derivative. Then you do the same thing in a different order, and you compare what you get from that. And of course, we all know well that partial partial x partial y squared is equal to partial partial y partial x squared, uh, partial squared partial y partial x. Right? This is the old classical, very well known analysis fact. And the thing over there is saying the same thing except that. It's not any longer true. What it's saying is that the difference between the two partial differential operators of degree two is, well, it's not zero, but it's in some sense at least simpler than the initial operators you looked at, because it's degree one. It's a degree one differential operator. And which direction? Well, it's calculated there. It's the bracket of N and W. Okay. Let's look at this. What is this? So first, I need to fix some notation. H is the element in the Lie algebra that's corresponding to the geodesic flow. That's the diagonal subgroup. No. That's the diagonal subgroup, right? I mean, this is an element, but I consider this element as an element in the Lie algebra. And when you take the one parameter subgroup that is attached to that element, you get the diagonal subgroup. This element, I call it U plus, is unipotent and gives you the upper unipotent one parameter subgroup. U minus is the opposite guy. I have three such matrices. These span as self two, little s of two. W is the guy we used before is sort of the one responsible for SO2, SO2 inside SL2. Now, here's a horrible expression, or there are two horrible expressions. We call this the degree, this degree two element here, we call the Casimir operator, or Casimir element. And it's very important for the word to tell you. And one reason it's important is that it's actually fixed under SL2R. So, when you have SL2R, it acts on itself by conjugation, which tells you that SL2R, the group, acts on the Lie algebra by conjugation, well, the fancy phrases by the adjoint representation. Now, when you have these formal products that we consider when we talk about degree two partial differential operators, then the adjoint also extends to, to these formal products. So this makes perfect sense. We just apply the conjugation to each thing individually and again look at the formal product. We just do the obvious thing. You extend the way you think you would. And the original action, when SL2R acts on little SL2R, that 
there's no vector except the zero vector, which is fixed under all of capital S sub 2R. But in this degree 2 differential operators, there is an element that's not moved at all by all of S sub 2R. And that's kind of a special element. It's actually unique up to a scalar. So it's a very, whenever something is unique up to a scalar, it's sort of a canonical object, right? Like the Haar measure is unique up to a scalar. This guy is equally important for the story because it's unique up to the scalar and moreover it's very well related to the to the Laplace because if you have a function that comes from the manifold on the manifold we had on the, on the surface on H mod gamma on the surface we had the Laplace operator if you consider that function as a function on x on s sub 2r mod gamma, then you can apply this Casimir operator to it, and all you're getting is Laplace applied to that function. So this is a a concrete extension of the Laplace operator to the space of functions on x. Um, maybe a few words why we should believe that. For instance, you could, you could calculate that this is true very concretely. Well, you just need to do this kind of thing. But of course you could say, well, S on Twa, it's a whole three-dimensional thing. It's very complicated. So checking this for all group elements might, for this element, might be a bit messy and yeah, it, it's a calculation, but you can help yourself and make the calculation easier. For instance, you can start analyzing what happens to this guy, to this whole guy, when you conjugate by the diagonal subgroup. When you conjugate the, by the diagonal subgroup, then H is diagonal itself. So H doesn't move, H doesn't move. So this element doesn't change when you conjugate by the diagonal subgroup, which is good u plus is changed by the diagonal subgroup in a particular manner but u minus is changed in the opposite manner so the f the formal product is not changed because u plus is multiplied by e to the t say u minus is multiplied by e to the minus t so the formal product is not changed at all and the same here Um, this is one case, and then you could also consider the one parameter subgroup of u plus. Then it would get a bit messy, the whole calculation would get a bit messy. So it's actually better to not consider the action of capital S of 2, but to linearize it once more, to take the derivative once more and do the calculation by checking what, an, what the three elements h, u plus, and u minus do when they act on this operator. But of course, there's this question, how does it act? So you need to develop the corresponding calculus. But it's sort of a fancy, it's, it's just a version of the product rule, right? Because I said that our extension of the action on of S and 2R on degree 2 operators is precisely just the the obvious let both thing act. And if you now take the derivative of such an action with respect to G, you have a product of two things. So you have a product rule and what you get looks a bit different than what you expected. But if you follow this calculus properly, which is done in the notes, then you prove precisely that claim here. Unfortunately, there will be a couple of, of calculations that I just don't want to do in detail here. Um, I think there are no questions. What's the best question you can come up with?
to other people for my group. They're supposed to slow me down today. Now we have something that can act on all functions on the unit tangent bundle. The, the Laplace was only defined on the manifold. And when we are trying to construct this invariant measure that lives on the unit tangent bundle, we, we will define some way of of taking the eigenfunction and producing a new eigenfunction for the Casimir operator. But that function doesn't live on the manifold any longer. It's a function that lives on x. It takes into account the directions in some way. And it's still an eigenfunction for the Laplace. So we can write down lots of formulas because we have the same eigenvalue even. That's the advantage. So it helps us lifting the functions and the measure. Okay, so next comes another D2. We know what S, L, 2, R is. Those are just the matrices that don't have trace. Now, and we also know what they mean. We can think of them as directions in the group. And hence, we can think of these guys as partial differential operators of degree 1 acting on the smooth functions on the space X. But it's kind of useful to tensorize this with the complex numbers, so you get S, L, 2, C. And again, well, we know what complex multiplication does. I mean, we can let the complex numbers act on functions. We just take a function, and if the complex number is i, we multiply the function by i. So this guy, S, L, 2, complex numbers, also acts on smooth functions on the space. But it's not any longer sort of really a direction. It's not really any longer the partial derivative along a direction. It's really the convex combination. No, not convex. Complex combination of two partial derivatives when, when this guy acts as a differential operator on smooth functions on x. So this is what happens in the next slide. We we define two rather weird looking matrices, traceless. So they have trace zero. So, and we can express them also in terms of the old basis that we had. We had the h, the u plus, and u minus as a basis of little s and 2r. And these two elements are elements in SL2C, so we can write them in some the complex combination of the old basis vectors. Okay, what are they good for? They are called the raising and lowering operators. Maybe I should remind you. I didn't write down this formula. The H we defined, and you can take the bracket of h and u plus. And if I'm not mistaken, you just get u plus. And the same thing with minus. If you have minus, you get minus u minus. And then there's a, another, direct, another formula that tells you what the bracket of u plus and u minus is, and it's twice the h. Those are just matrix multiplications, so I don't jump up and down and do those products. However, I want to point this out because the e plus behaves with respect to the w just as the u plus behaves with respect to the h. That's why I introduced them. So the yeah, many groups are important for us. The H is co of course always important for us because the H corresponds to the geodesic flow and corresponds to the whole goal that we want to 
achieve. We want to establish a connection between the quantum chaos and the classical dynamical system, right? We want to find this microlocal lift, this invariant function on the unit tangent bundle. So the age is definitely important. The k initially is, is sort of acting trivially on the function, but that might not be the correct thing somehow. Maybe you should work a bit to get your function phi behave differently. There will be some miracle calculation in the end where all these things are important. So the W is actually diagonalizable, right? W is this element 1 minus 1. It's diagonalizable, but its eigenvalues are plus minus e or something. So it's not diagonalizable over R, but it's diagonalizable over the complex numbers, which means the W is conjugate to the H over the complex numbers, which means I can cook up some formulas for, for some matrices, complex matrices, that behave with respect to W the same way as the H behaves with respect to the U, almost. So the only difference is that there's some um, two that shows up. So the, the, the answer here is plus minus two i e plus minus. So that's, that's why I define the e plus and the e minus, so that the w behaves with respect to the e almost the same way as the h behaves with respect to the u, u. Of course, for the h, the eigenvalues are real, so I get here to see real eigenvalues in some sense. But for the w, the eigenvalues are plus minus e, so I have to see here some complex numbers, otherwise it would be weird. And also the, there's some, the h is one half everywhere built in, so because of that I also have a difference here of two. Right, so these are the concrete matrices that behave very concretely when I take the bracket with respect to the W. It's a completely trivial formula. Now, here's something interesting that happens. If you take an eigenfunction of weight n and you apply this complex differential operator E plus to it, you get an eigenfunction, but of weight n plus 2. And that's why the operator E plus is called the raising operator. It, it raises the, the weight of the eigenfunction. And E minus is the lowering operator. It, it sends the weight down. So when we start later with our eigenfunction on the surface, then it has weight zero because it's K invariant, right? And when we apply E plus to it, then we get a new function of weight 2, and so on and so on, in both, the, both ways. So this is why they are important for us. We can use them to cook up new functions out of the eigenfunction, and these new functions will not be functions that live on the manifold any longer. They will really live on the unit tangent bundle, because they depend on the, on the angle in a particular way. Now, how do we prove this? What is the next? Yeah, this stupid formula. There are a few. It's not stupid. A very interesting formula comes next, but let me prove that to you. You should believe now that this really holds. We take a function in a n. We apply e plus to it. That's a new function that's cooked up from the old by some complex combination of partial derivatives. And we want to know what happens to it when we apply w to it. Because I calculated in the beginning that I can find out whether an element belongs to a n by knowing what w does to it. Now, 
if only the order of w and e plus were reversed, then I could get rid of the w because I know what w does to n, to f, namely more or less n. So I write it down in the wrong order. And then I know that this is equal to i n f. And then I have, well, a correction term, right? Because I, dx dy is not dy dx. So I need to do this bracket thing, w comma e plus bracket applied to f. But I know what w bracket e plus is. It's 2i e plus and voila, we're done. We get i n plus 2f. So that's why, for instance, this formula that I had before, what, what's the difference between these two degree two differential operators is important to us because it Uh, yes, which is good because we wanted to make a statement about e plus of f. Thank you. Okay, now when we look back at the definition of e plus and e minus, there are some i's, but there's also some symmetry between the definitions. If you conjugate the one, you get the other. So I stated that here, if you take the sum of the two, you get four times h. There are just a couple of immediate corollaries from the definitions, right? I mean, if you believe this way of writing it, when you take the sum, you get two times h. Uh, two, four, yes, small problems. And this is again just a formal calculation. It's some formula that you just check. The Casimir we calculated, we defined before in a real way, using just real matrices and their formal products in the universal developing algebra. And now we have these complex matrices E plus and E minus, and you just write this down, this down here, and Distribute complex linear and then see whether whether the complex stuff goes out of the window and it does and what remains is real and that's the Casimir you started from. So it's just again a calculation. There's some nice symmetry between these formulas again that if you write the E plus and E minus in different order, all that changes is that this, this term here is slightly different with a sign. Um, maybe I should also say something else. It's a nice corollary of this observation here that the E plus raises the level, or the, the weight, I'm sorry I'm using all the wrong phrases. I think it's the weight, not the level is different. Um, e minus lowers it. The W leaves it the same, right? But that's the definition. W maps a n to a n. So in particular you get to know that if you take a k finite function and you apply any differential operator to it, you get a k finite function. Because e plus, e minus and w span SL2 of complex numbers. So because the statement is true that e plus and e minus and w send k finite vectors to k finite vectors, it's actually true for all differential operators that you build this way. Okay, so we also want to know, want to understand what's going on when we think of the adjoint of the differential operators. And there's this very old basic formula that says when you integrate from A to B, um, 
f1 of t f2 prime of t dt then you get almost minus integral a to b f1 prime of t f2 of t dt well except for the term that is missing f1 f2 a b if i got it correct and there are many situations where you can just forget the term in the middle for instance if the function vanishes at infinity if your functions have complex support and you integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity then who cares about this term here it's zero times zero minus zero times zero and then this whole thing is this integration by parts formula is saying that the adjoint of taking the derivative is minus taking the derivative right you can write this as f1 f2 prime is equal to minus f1 prime f2 I guess you ornament this with some complex bars but that's the basic fact if you have here this map of taking the derivative you can move it over at the cost of a minus that means the adjoint of taking derivative is minus taking the derivative and this holds also in that, con that context here where we think of these elements in the Lie algebra as partial differential operators acting for instance on smooth functions with compact support on the group then the adjoint of taking derivative is equal to minus taking the derivative if the element is real and otherwise it's minus m bar of the thing and once you know this for compact functions for smooth functions of compact support on SL2R you can actually work a bit and get the same statement for other spaces like uh, if x is a compact quotient of SL2R you have the same statement again and even if it's not a compact quotient there's still hope that this formula holds so we will just believe this formula and keep going so we are interested in the Casimir Casimir operator what's the adjoint of the Casimir operator well it's the Casimir operator first of all it was a real element right so there's no comp no bar thing and second it one way we defined it was this way um, yes this way when you write h composed with h and you take the adjoint of that you get minus h composed with minus h which is h composed with h when you do this thing u plus composed with u minus and you take the adjoint of that you get u minus composed with u plus again with two minuses which cancel so you get this other term and this term gives you that term so the adjoint of the Casimir is the Casimir Casimir is self-adjoint similar you can check that the adjoint of this raising and lowering operators is minus the opposite one something one can check because we we have many formulas that are completely elementary to write down and from there one can see that okay so now comes something that's a bit closer to the micro local lift we, we start to work with the eigenvalue so far we didn't care about what the eigenvalue is so now we really write down a function that is in some nice space so this is the space should have some definition c is something like c infinity all the derivatives should be bounded also so that we never go out of the of the l2 spaces right if we have complex functions of 
that are smooth and we take partial derivatives we always have compact support functions that are smooth hence they're always in L2 hence we can always write down what is the adjoint of it we can always take inner products but it's not sufficient to look at smooth functions of compact support because the eigenfunction that we're interested in doesn't have compact support but it's known and I'm allowing myself to just use it here that these eigenfunctions decay in the cusp so they are definitely L2 and they also um, all the derivatives are also L2 and I'm just allowing myself to assume that so C is this class of function where all the derivatives are fine so that we can write down two norms of things so lambda is our eigenvalue it's negative and I can write it especially since I think of the absolute value of lambda going to infinity I can write it as one quarter plus another number squared real number squared and then there's a claim that the size of e plus applied to f is given by this formula so f is some eigenfunction and it has some given weight maybe originally the n is zero but later maybe the n is not zero so i want to keep the n in place and then i want to know what is the size of e plus applied to f so e plus applied to f that's some smooth function that is an l2 hence it has a two norm hence i can look at this formula and let's try to see how this comes into place what do i want to calculate i want to calculate e plus f e plus f because that's the norm of e plus f squared i write it this way because i know what the adjoint of e plus is so i can write this as if i'm not mistaken we said it's minus e minus right so we get minus e minus composed with e plus applied to f in a product with f and then there was some other formula here this formula which involves the Casimir the, comp the composition of e plus and e minus and only w's that's great because my f is an eigenfunction for w I know perfectly well what the w does to f it's also an eigenfunction for the for the Casimir so suddenly I can calculate this very concretely in terms of n and the eigenvalue and when you do this you get well minus the eigenvalue plus one quarter n squared plus one half n times the norm of f squared and there should be some resemblance to the left formula here right because the lambda is from the Casimir the n squared even with the one quarter is from the ww and the n is from the w now the signs of these things should also be clear because the w gives you an i so here you get two i's so that gives you a plus and here you already have one i in front but w applied to f gives you another i so you get again a plus 
just happens this way. And then you realize after staring at at this expression for some time that you when you square this you get this if the r is defined this way so we define this parameter r using this formula and then we get this formula and in the same way we get this formula yes a lambda is negative i know and it's big because i think of my eigenvalue go to infinity. So I don't care about the eigenvalues between zero and one quarter. Some people might care about those eigenvalues, but here I don't care about these eigenvalues because I think of a big lambda. So I can do it. Um, how much time do I have? Just nothing, yes, I thought so. So, that's always a good question to ask, yes. This is the preview of what happens in the afternoon. We start with the function that was the eigenfunction for the Laplace operator. That has zero weight. And we just write zero to remember that this is the zero weight function. And then we apply e plus to it, and we get a weight 2 function, which you can normalize so that it is again of norm 1. That's precisely there so that this 2 norm after dividing by this is again 1. Because that function we assumed had 1, and by these choices of these denominators, all of these functions here have norm 1. So out of one eigenfunction for the Laplace, we get infinitely many eigenfunctions for the Casimir. Isn't that great? Thank you. Here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, should, I, I think it oh, so, in the calculation, in the calculation, I worked with the square, but then I think this is okay. I mean, there could always be some two, four issue popping up here, but I think that's okay. Yes. Otherwise, I don't have this raising and lowering operators, right? I mean, is that a good answer? If you